The United States Navy is an organization of almost impossible power on the planet today, with the capacity to obliterate almost every nation's capital without survivors or warning. This massive organization of hundreds of ships and thousands of sailors works mostly independently of the rest of the nation with its own methods of promotion and procurement. Congress hypothetically oversees it, but it mostly polices itself and only interacts with the legislator when it's time to beg for money. The American people trust this organization and most of the time pay it no attention at all as it patrols foreign waters to terrify every other country on the planet. A Navy promises strength through discipline, training its sailors relentlessly to mechanically operate its deadly war machines, which constitute some of the most advanced technology in the world. In 2017, the Navy's most prominent fleet had four separate crashes with civilian ships. In two of said crashes, 17 sailors died. They died because the Navy was, unknown to most, a shambling mess. Overworked and understaffed, stretched far too thin on ships that were coming apart at the seams. This is No One Is Competent, a show dedicated to pulling away the curtain on how just much of a slip shod shit show everyone and everything in power is and today we're talking about the navy i say we because i am wyatt also known as azalea your first host on this voyage of the damned and i am joined with me as always by jay hello I thought you were going to continue. I didn't know you want me to do an introduction. <laughs> I don't know, man. I was kind of riffing. How are you? How's your day been? Doing all right. <laughs> uh, this this is our second time recording because uh, last time you got you got smited right before we yeah, hit record. Yeah, power outage. A building wide power outage. Um, literally, like right, like a couple minutes before i think we were gonna start (laughs) yeah so like we uh i mean it's good that we're ahead of schedule right like this episode isn't gonna come out for another like two and a half weeks as we're recording it right now um hopefully we'll be like more up to date and communicating with people um i know basically only uh just my close friends have watched this podcast it's out Hopefully, by the time that you are listening to this episode, it is out on Apple, Hopefully. who has spurned us and trapped us in limbo hell. Yeah, we, we're we're on we're on Spotify. We're even on Google Podcasts. I don't know if anybody uses Google Podcasts, but we are there. I didn't even know we were on Google <laughs> Podcasts. Jay is just competent enough to get us on Google well, Podcasts. Anchor. <laughs> I'm competent enough to, to to click the little thing on Anchor to let them do that for us but yeah we're on soundcloud we're on youtube wherever you're listening to this we are glad you're here this is a non-sponsored show with no advertisements besides us because we think we're cool and we think that you should think we're cool in that lens i am azalea wyatt on twitter i think i actually got my twitter at wrong last time (laughs) because i forget which one of my two names comes first (laughs) um i am a youtuber at wyatt the word weaver i make really fun video essays you should check out especially if you're into nerdy stuff but also just if you like well-reasoned arguments and explorations of literature also follow me on Twitter so you can uh, see me scream into the void. Jay, where can folks find you? You can primarily find me on Twitter at jaharis48. Um, and, you know, if you go there, you'll find links to various other websites, which I'm active on. But really mostly just Twitter. Um, every... You know, uh, Jay, I don't know if I've told you this yet, but you, you are building quite the fandom on the Wyatt side. Uh, I've had two separate of my friends and family be like, yeah, this, I like this Jay guy's voice. It's got very, very sultry tones. Yeah, they're, they're fucking with you. <laughs> I, I, I personally think you sound like a sandpaper ghost, but that's just my opinion. I do like ghosts. One of the weirdest things with this podcast is, like, how much do people want to know about us? Like, 
I'm certainly not going to be out here sharing my baby photos, and Jay is, of course, an international man of mystery, but, you know, we do aim to sort of give you a peek behind the curtain each episode. This time, uh, I will tell you that uh, Jay, one of the more um, eccentric things about him is he is a huge fan of not just red wine, but dry red wine, which he drinks for pleasure because he thinks it tastes good. And then doesn't actually get drunk, which I personally think is one of the most psychotic things I've ever heard in my entire life. I mean, this is a diagnosis of of psychosis coming from somebody who, on the full moon, likes to go out and punch trees while on voice call. So, you know. Hey, hey, I never said I liked it. I never said I liked it. I do it. (laughs) I mean, when you're manic, you kind of like everything, right? <laughs> Isn't that kind of the point? I know. I've never been manic. I'll just take your word for it. You should try it. You know, you just like take your shirt off, blast the first Doors album, and I feel really like, good tweeting. I feel like all I would do is maybe just drink an extra glass of, of red wine and spend the night on Twitter. No, yeah, Jay. No, if you were if you were manic, you would make like seventeen vtuber clips in like two (laughs) hours like and you would code an entire website you would publish a list of like your top 30 uh surface to air missiles like you would you would read like seven books and and you would find a whole new way to gaslight people you would fucking you would go off i i'd love to see it it does sound strangely entertaining now that you now that you spell it out like that Hey, listen, the only problem with being manic is that you have to come down. If you never come down, there is absolutely zero problems with being manic. I suppose that's one way of looking at it. Yeah, especially if you're, uh... I don't know, I've never spent my life savings when I'm manic. Unlike my grandmother. Anyway, moving on... Uh, this is the No One Is Competent podcast. Like we said, you can follow us on Twitter at not underscore competent. We have an email, no one is competent at gmail.com. Uh, you can send us your questions. Uh, you can reach out to us. Uh, you can tell us how pretty you think we are. You can tell us about some government or corporate incompetence you see in your own life. We can ensure anonymity. Our music is done by the legendary Sam Bryce, and like I said, we are not sponsored. There are no commercials. You can help out the podcast by promoting it to your friends, to your coworkers, to your mailman, and to the guy in your neighborhood who is fucking with your mailman by occasionally putting holes in his tires because he's a terrible person because you should love mailmen. What is your problem with mailmen? Anyway, uh, you can do that also by liking uh, and subscribing on the YouTube. Even if you're not listening on YouTube, just kind of go over there and hit subscribe and hit like. Boost us in the algorithm so this will get out to more people. Leave us a review on the podcast app you're listening on. We aim for five stars, but be honest. uh, If if you don't know, the way most of these websites and things work is they're they're just tracking um, engagement. So, like... If you hit like, if you hit dislike, if you have five stars, you have one stars. They they just care if you interact with it. So interact with us. Give us your time. Give us your attention. It'll be great. I promise. It will be a bit awkward when we get that Raid Shadow Legend sponsorship. I know like one person who thinks that's like kind of a good game, (laughs) but um, that person. I I do not. I do not share any. Like, like their taste in video games is, like, utterly <laughs> baffling to me across the board. Fair. Um, if you don't like Bloodborne, are you even a real human being? No. Okay, enough. What are we talking about today? Uh, well, today we're talking about the United States Navy, and specific the 7th Fleet, and the few incidents that uh, involved it back in 2017. All right. I'll bite. Why do we need seven fleets? Well... The U.S. Navy is, as you may know, one of the larger navies in the world, actually the largest in terms of tonnage, and it's pretty much inarguably the most powerful maritime force in the world at the moment. I mean, people could argue that, 
if you want to argue it with me, you can on Twitter or something. I'll show why you are wrong. So give me give me an example. It's like like you know, there's like just pulling ahead, and there's lapping folks. Like surely, like China and Russia and Britain, they they have big navies, right? Uh, well, China is is actually larger than the U.S. in terms of the amount of hulls, um, in terms of the amount of ships. Uh, the People's Liberation Army Navy is has a few dozen more ships than the U.S. Navy. However, the average size of their vessels is much smaller because until recently, they were primarily dedicated towards coastal defense. So you have a lot of small missile boats and patrol ships and the like. But yeah, so, so the U.S. Navy is considerably more powerful and if you look at just the average size of the ship in comparison with the Chinese Navy, and really nobody else comes close. When you compare the U.S. having 11 aircraft carriers in active service to China having one, Britain having on a good day two, it's really no comparison. And, like, imagine that I'm just like an alien come down to Earth. Why does America have and need this Navy? And what makes the Navy, like, different from the Army, the Air Force, the Marines? How does that work? Well, the most notable difference would be the fact that they are primarily on the water. You know, that's what makes them a Navy. And that allows the Navy to project power in a way which... All the other branches really can't do. The Air Force comes the closest, but the Air Force at the end of the day is reliant on friendly air bases in, you know, around the world to base out of. Whereas the Navy, you know, you can take a ship and sail it pretty much wherever you want, providing that you're on water and 70% of the planet is covered by water. And why would America go places outside its shores and its immediate trading partners? I mean, its immediate trading partners cover pretty much the entire world. One of the aspects of the highly globalized society we live in is that trade lanes stretch all over the place. And if you want to ensure the safety of your trade networks and potentially your economic position in the world, you have to... You have to safeguard that with the large navy. And these aren't just uh, ships with flags and uh, everybody get along messages painted on the side in various languages. Uh, like, these are weapons. Oh, yes. Yeah, so these are heavily armed warships in large part. So we're in the Seventh Fleet. Do we only have seven? Does, does America? I say we, but you know. Uh, if anyone's listening to this from Iceland, uh, hi. Uh, <laughs> does America only have seven fleets? Yes. At the moment, there are actually seven numbered fleets in the United States Navy. However, one of them is the 10th Fleet, which is actually the Navy's fancy name for their cyber warfare division. So it's not, you know, traditional fleet of boats on the water, so to speak. When you're talking about those, we have six um, numbered two through seven. What happened to the 1st, the 8th, and the ninth? <laughs> Don't worry about it. They were mothballed after the Cold War. That's what happened. But whatever. We are talking about... Uh, we're, we're not going to give you... This is not a tour of the incompetencies of the entire American Navy, which has been around since continental days, uh, like scooters in 1775. <laughs> Uh, we are talking about the Seventh Fleet, and we are talking about the year 2017. And the Seventh Fleet is um, out of Yokosuka, Japan, and it's uh, part of a half of the other half being the Third Fleet that patrols the Pacific Ocean, which is huge. Uh, the Pacific Ocean is way bigger. No matter how big you think it is, it's bigger. Most maps uh, distort its size, and most maps have it being pretty freaking huge. Um, the Seventh Fleet patrols a part of the world around Japan, the Koreas, China, Russia, Malaysia, Australia. It's got over half the world's population in it, over 30 countries. Yes. And really, it's a, it's a testament to the strength of the U.S. Navy that the 7th Fleet, as well as any of the numbered fleets, excluding the 10th, is arguably the strongest navy in, that given re in its given region. So just the 7th Fleet is, like, comparable in military strength to, like, the Chinese Navy. I would argue so, yes. Damn. 
Now, that might not always hold true. That will remain to be seen. But at the moment, I would say so. And remember, people, uh, the world is the way it is because of blood and threats. Uh, The U.S. is on top right now, and our economic system is on top right now because we have these warships patrolling more or less everywhere on the planet that ships can patrol. Uh, The vast majority of human civilization and, and trade and important stuff happens right next to shipping lanes and seas and ports, uh, even through rivers. Sure. For instance, I live in Augusta, Georgia, which is on the mighty savant. And, you know, we just happen to uh, fill the world's shipping lanes with essentially a gun to everyone's head, which we'll talk about in a bit. But now that J- um, Jay's given us the uh, sort of footnotes of the Seventh Fleet and all kind of add the things from the document by the way we have like this massive 18 page (laughs) document in front of us uh, while we're doing this Uh, you guys have no idea how hard we work in this podcast but also it's a complete slipshod effort and we're running by the seat of our pants i love it uh seven fleet has roughly 50 to 70 ships and over 150 aircraft um it is uh really 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 cool it's got a lot of uh, nuclear turret stuff it's got submarines uh, all, all kinds of hoo-ha. But I want to talk about Navy culture, uh, which I know a bit about because, and this is a bit embarrassing, but um, I I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I spent my high school years doing uh, Navy Junior Reserve Officer Trading Corps. I guess I need to explain to people what ROTC is. Uh, Jay, what's ROTC? Oh, well, it's... <laughs> More or less just a way of training people or getting people into the mindset of being an officer when they're still in education. Um, at least that's the way I've interpreted it, you know, through knowing people in ROTC. Obviously, I myself did not go through it. <laughs> Jay is completely incorrect. Uh, the Reserve Officer Training Corps system and the Junior Reserve Officer Training System is a uh, cult that our... Uh, that our government uses to brainwash children into building the military. It's very, very fun, and I really, really enjoyed it. It was kind of the only thing that kept me from killing myself for like a solid three years. But anyway, I was taught, uh, so yes, I was taught to be an officer in the Navy. Uh, I was going to go into the Navy for a very long time, but uh, did not for a lot of complicated reasons involving some medical stuff and whatnot. I have a lot of friends in the Navy right now in the Marine Corps, Um, but I did get some insight into how the Navy thinks, how it operates and well, it's a cult. The entire military is a cult. What do I mean when I say cult? That's like a big claim, right? Yeah. Everyone kind of knows about what a boot camp is. You know, when you sign up to be in the military, any branch, you go to a place, you get your head shaved and then you do a bunch of exercises while people yell at you, right? Something like that. And we generally think, oh, well, this is so people, you know, they need to look uniform. You know, everyone gets your, your, your head shaved, so you're the same as everybody else. Uh, you're wearing the same stuff, so you're part of an army. And then, you know, all the exercise to get you fit enough to be a soldier. And then you kind of get taught how to use your, your weapons. And then after that, you go to a technical school to kind of get taught whether you're going to be like an air crew or a trucker or in a tank or something. And that's part of it. But... If you've never been in a boot camp, and I have been exposed to them for about five days at a time uh, in very brief spurts, because again, I was 15 at the time, and you can't go full all the way on teenagers. Um, boot camp is specifically meant to psychologically break down any soldier or sailor that sets foot in it. Um, what happens is you are yelled at constantly, you are told to stay in formation, you are driven to utter exhaustion. Uh, if you go to a boot camp, uh, you will essentially never sleep better in your entire life than you sleep there, uh, because you will be exercising and moving around enough to where uh, you will essentially hit the pillow, fall asleep, and then you will wake up when you are told to wake up. This constant strain and constant getting yelled at uh, by people who will, like, conduct psychological warfare um, on you. Like, uh, they'll, they'll, like, ask you questions that there's no correct answer to. Uh, I remember one time being in mess hall and, like, 
uh, where like you're just supposed to like look down at your plate and eat the whole time. And a guy coming in, one of the drill sergeants coming in the door, and I like looked up. Why are you looking at me? You checking me out? You think I'm pretty? You think I'm cute? No, no drill sergeant. Oh, you see, you think I'm ugly then? No drill sergeant. So you think I'm cute? Yes, drill sergeant. Stuff like that, right? (laughs) And what this is meant to do is, it is essentially meant to break you down mentally. But but why? Why would they do it? Well, they want you to think about the unit. This is the whole theory behind militaries going back hundreds of years and around the world is they don't want you to think about you as yourself. They want you to think about the unit. They want you to start thinking about everybody as what the army calls your battle buddy. Militaries, in order to win wars, in order to complete the mission, people are going to die. You cannot be selfish. You have to be working for a purpose, not yourself. Um, And the U.S. is partly strong because it's fought a lot of wars where people sacrifice for one another and, for instance, jumped up on a machine gun position to give suppressing fire and then they were probably going to hit by that. How do you convince someone to do that? Well, you convince them that their job is to their unit, not to themselves. Um, You bond them by trauma, by yelling at them all together, by having them do very vigorous exercise together. They bond to each other in that strange, in that shared struggle. You get them to sacrifice for the unit. Uh, If you're an officer, this happens to you, but you're at college at the same time and you get fed propaganda constantly. You get taught to compete. You are supposed to sacrifice for each other, but you're also competing against each other. You want to be the best because the U.S. military is the strongest, most powerful, most esteemed organization on the planet. We are the best. We have college degrees. You know how hard it is to get in the North Point? You know how hard it is to get in the Naval Academy? It is harder to get in the Naval Academy than it is to get into, I think, any college in my state. (laughs) Um, And you get run rough shot and you you, in order to survive in a place like that you have to have a drive you have to have a fire you have to think that you're the best you have to want to be the best you have to want it and the people who want the most those are the people in the navy who become surface weapons officers uh these are the guys who aren't in the submarines they're not in the bases doing logistics these are the guys in destroyers there's a common saying in the navy that surface warfare officers they eat their own they are bred for competition, to be perfected. And of course, then you're stuck on a ship. And the thing about being stuck on a ship is obviously you can't leave. Uh, Most people probably don't even fully know where they are. A lot of times that's confidential. Um, And you are in very close quarters. Uh, Pro tip, don't be fat on a Navy ship. And especially don't be tall if you're going to be on a submarine. Um, There's some people who just can't serve on subs because they're too big. Um, but you're in very cramped court quarters, uh, even the most sprawling, largest aircraft carriers, uh, Jay, you've been on uh, some ships in like museums and what, they're, they are not comfortable to move around on. No, it's not exactly a cruise ship. Yeah, you have to duck uh, going under hatches a lot, you have to squeeze through corridors that are not fully built to have two people passing side by side. Um, you're going to be seeing the same people over and over. You're going to be sleeping next to them. And, you know, it's a ship. It's a confined place. So you're going to, even though you're totally relying on those around you, drowned in routine, you're going to fight. You're going to gossip. You're going to fuck all your fellow sailors. But at the end of the day, you got to live with them. And uh, this is all part of that greater good thing. And the sailors on the ships we're going to be talking about, the USS Fitzgerald and the USS John S. McCain, um, they loved each other, and they also hated each other, just the way you would any group of people that you have to be in a confined space with a lot. And these uh, two ships, they are a part of... They're, they're not random ships. These are both destroyers. They are specifically Arleg Burke destroyers, uh, which I know, but Jay knows. <laughs> so I am now going to give over the mic for Jay to nerd the heck out. Thank you. So... Originally designed in the 1980s, the Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyers have proved to be the most widely built and in- influential destroyers of the late 20th century. They're the single most prolific class of ship in the Navy, and they'll be found in pretty much any surface group fielded by the U.S. Navy. 
In terms of size, just so people get a mental image of them, these are about 500 feet long, and they have a displacement over, of over 8,000 tons, which actually makes them larger than some World War II cruisers. Their main role in sort of like a big war, if you imagine a big great power war against China or against the Soviet Union, which was obviously the enemy at the time when these were designed, um, would be to provide air cover to carrier strike groups. These things are packed to the brim with missiles, and most of these will be anti-aircraft missiles. Um, however, they can also serve very well in the anti-submarine warfare and land attack roles. So is it worth saying that this is essentially just a mobile platform full of long-ranged weapons? Basically, um, yeah, and that's actually a good way of putting it, because I think a lot of people are familiar with like World War II-style ships. And they think of a warship as a hull in the water with a bunch of guns on it. Or maybe airplanes, if it's a carrier. But these destroyers are basically just a floating platform for missiles. The uh, Burke class contains 96 of what are called the Mark 41 vertical launch system missile cells. Each of one of these cells, you can imagine a vertical, basically a tube, the length of a telephone pole that's sitting um, inside of the ship has got 96 of them. Now, in each individual one of these cells, you can put up to four missiles, depending on the type of missile we're talking about. Now, the exact loadout remains classified. Um, the Navy doesn't say which ships are running with which missile combinations. But needless to say, this allows for a lot of flexibility and a lot of firepower. Uh, to just name a few, you can use Tomahawk missiles. These are cruise missiles with a range of over a thousand miles, meaning that a Burke sitting off of the coast of New York could theoretically saturate a target as far away as Omaha, Nebraska. I want you all to think about that again. I am living in Augusta, Georgia right now. And so if one of these destroyers was like, I don't know, off the coast of Venezuela, they could blow me up yeah. in my house. Yeah. And I would have no way of knowing it. Yeah. If you're a ship, these things can destroy you from the other side of the horizon. Oh yeah, easily. In order to find their targets to destroy, they also had very advanced radar systems. And obviously, in order to hit stuff like that, they're using other ships for recon. They might be even using satellites. Sure. But they'll be think about the way our world works. Almost every prominent capital and prominent city of any nation on the planet is in the range of these things. Yes. Uh, in terms of deterrence theory, in terms of uh, thinking about why people don't go to war because of, of threats, uh, we mostly think about nukes. But even beyond nukes, the point of the U.S. Navy is for the American government to just have a gun to the head of every world leader on the planet at all times. Because no matter who you are, no matter how big you think you are, these things are out there. Yeah. And if we want to hit you, we can. And we patrol these things around, we pony them all around the world to remind people that we can do that. And in many ways, that is their function, like, like even more than actually doing the destroying. Uh, which is why it would be so humiliating if they uh, accidentally hit a uh, container ship in the middle of the night. Indeed, it probably would be. So, 2017. We'll tell you a little bit about 2017 uh, in, a, in a bit, because it was a special year uh, for reasons even more than the ones you're thinking of. But it was not a good year for the 7th Fleet. Uh, in May, the USS Antietam uh, accidentally hit a fishing vessel. Uh, there were a bunch of close calls, but our first deadly incident of 2017 took place on June 17th on the USS Fitzgerald. And just in case you're curious, I know you are, it is named after William Charles Fitzgerald, who is, or was, a uh, Navy officer who was uh, killed in action during Vietnam. We're going to do this in several parts, uh, but for now, I'm just going to tell you what physically happened to the USS Fitzgerald. So, to set the scene, it is the middle of the night, uh, 1.20 in the a.m. 
uh, to be precise. And the USS Fitzgerald has just launched out of Yokosuka, Japan, earlier uh, the previous day. And they are currently um, right off the Izu Peninsula, okay? This is, you don't have to be super familiar with Japanese geography, but just know this is one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. Japan is, of course, an incredibly economically advanced nation, and you got tons of ships from America, from China, from Vietnam, the Koreas, the Philippines, Indonesia, just all coming through here all at once. But it is pitch black. You can probably see miles, like 15, 14 miles off uh, the Japanese coastline. But as huge as ships that travel in here are, like container ships, oil tankers, uh, these massive trading vessels are way bigger than a destroyer will ever be. But they don't have tons of lights on them. And the black of night in ocean is a pitch black that people who live in modern cities probably can't even fully imagine. It's 1.20 at night, and obviously the Fitzgerald is moving. We're not just going to park this ship in the middle of a shipping lane and have everyone take a nap. No, there's people on watch, there's people watching the radar, there's people steering the ship. There's a lot of folks on the bridge itself. Uh, a lot of them are looking at the radars. There's three different radar systems on the ship. There's people in the combat room watching the radars, and then they are both talking to the people on the bridge. The bridge, by the way, uh, if you don't know anything about ships, the bridge is basically where the ship is steered and commanded from. Uh, if you're picturing like an aircraft carrier destroyer, you know that big tall thing? That big sort of superstructure probably in the middle or towards the front? That's the bridge. That's where the captain's chair is. Generally, there's a separate weapons uh, department uh, command center that's like in the middle of the ship. And you have a lot of radars there and in a few separate radar rooms. But... Just know that there's a lot of people on the radar, even in the bridge, and that radar is only showing a few other ships in the area, and most radar men think those ships are moving in the opposite direction. So, suddenly, around 1.20 in the a.m., uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade Parker storms into the bridge. She's actually the junior officer on deck at the time, which means that she's partially in charge, but there's one person on the bridge who is higher rank than her, or at least assigned in a superior position to her. And she tells them that there's two ships coming on the ship from the starboard side. All right, quick Navy lesson. Starboard and port, you have probably heard these before, and you probably think that, oh, starboard is right when you're on the water, and port is left. Yeah. No, that's wrong. <laughs> w when you're on a ship, it, we don't just say starboard is right and port is left because that's just a fun thing to do. No. Um... When people are on a huge vessel, there's people all over it, and they're facing all sorts of different directions. And port and starboard are the left and right side of the ship in reference to the bow or the front of the ship. So if you're facing towards the front of the ship, starboard is on your right and port is on your left. If you're facing towards the stern, the aft, the back of the ship... Starboard is on your left and port is on your right. The reason we use port and starboard is not just because it's fun to use different words because you're on a ship. It's used because ev so everyone can stay on the same phase of mind on this. Everyone knows where everything is. We're not just turned around because you're facing one way and I'm facing the other. And by the way, if you have a hard time remembering that port is left and starboard is right, um, you can remember it by the mnemonic. There's always a little bit of port left in the bottle. Uh, that is the cheat code for a lot of people. But Parker comes in and she's like, hey, there's like two ships on our starboard side and they are really close to us. Remember, the radar shows that there's nothing close to us. Uh, but indeed, at that moment, um, they are five and six thousand yards respectively away from two separate ships and 14 um, thousand yards away from a collision course of a third ship. Uh, the woman in control of the Fitzgerald at the time, the officer in charge of the bridge, is a person by the name of Lieutenant Kopik. And Kopik goes out to see this. And she goes out on the starboard side of the ship and she sees the crystal, which is just an, a trading vessel. It is a huge, imposing 
container ship. It's basically a skyscraper uh, laid horizontally. That's how big this thing is. Oh, yeah. And for people who, who aren't familiar, as big as destroyers are, commercial ships, the big cargo ships and tankers, are massive in comparison. I mean, some of these are bigger than aircraft carriers. They're, they're large. If, if a commercial, like, trading ship, like, for instance, like, rammed a destroyer, as powerful as a destroyer is, they would reduce it to essentially a crumpled tinfoil, um, which is why these ships stay really far away from each other. You may think, oh, why is it so bad? They're thousands of yards away. Well, the Fitzgerald was at the time doing 20 knots, uh, nautical miles per hour. And uh, th these are not cars with, like, advanced braking systems. Th these are on the water. There's a lot less traction. Stopping is really hard. Turning is slow, especially with ships this big. And uh, generally, they stay really, really far away from each other because when they collide, people die. And also, probably more importantly to the companies in charge, is millions of dollars in repair fees. So suddenly, Kopik realizes that she has gotten her ship in between the Crystal and another ship called the Wan He 266, which are both coming directly at the Fitzgerald. Now... The radar finally picks these ships up, and it looks like one of them's going to pass behind. It looks like one of them's going to pass in front, but they can't be fully sure, and they're getting bigger. Kopik goes out, and she sees the superstructure of the crystal bearing down on her. So later, what would happen early in the morning on the 17th would be scrutinized by several Navy investigations and dozens of journalists. People would go over this incident second by second for what happened. Some people would point out that Kopik could have stopped the destroyer by throwing the engine in reverse and avoid the crash. Uh, some people said she could have turned the ship in certain ways, could avoid both. But she didn't know that, uh, and she did not do that. Have you ever been driving on the highway? Have you ever, like, gotten in a situation where there's two big rigs, two 18-wheeler trucks on other, either side of you? It's really stressful, right? It, like, creeps you out. Even if you know everything's fine, everything's going to be fine. Like, it's a really uncomfortable situation to be in. I know a person who even ran herself off the road once because that stressed her out so much and kind of made her lose control of the car. Imagine that's happening, but you're on a ship with uh, 300 people and your entire career that you've dreamed about for years is riding on whether or not you do this task properly. And also, it could potentially be deadly. Oh, and those two big rigs are actually, um, like several football field long container ships. That is what is going through Kopik's head at the moment. It's a lot. And in fact, she yells, oh shit, I'm fucked. I'm so fucked. She freezes, but then she snaps out of it and she gives an order. Kopik orders a hard deport to try and avoid the Wan Hay. This order is relayed to Helmsman Nelson, who freezes. Nelson had taken the helm for the first time in her entire life 25 minutes ago. She has to avoid an ever ship, and she is running on 25 minutes of lifetime helmsman experience. Now, Petty Officer First Class Williamson next to her sees that she's struggling, so he takes control of the helm and swings hard to port. This is too late, and it puts them on a collision course with the crystal. At 1 hour, 30 minutes, and 34 seconds a.m. on June the 17th, there is a collision. What physically happens is that the crystal's prow uh, breaches the captain's quarters of the ship, and its lower bow punctures berthing too. A berthing is basically just like a sleeping quarters on a ship. Uh, there's a few of them, and this is the second one. The crystal would slam in the Fitzgerald with so much force that it would create a 360 degree spin in five uh, minutes. It swung 20 degrees vertically uh, and then settles at a seven degree list to starboard. So it gets flung to the right and then snaps back in the left. This is basically throws almost everyone on it off their feet and then it settles back to the right because water is flooding in through those punctures. It's flooding into punctures where people sleep at night and are waking up to a very rude 
awakening. The bridge would evolve into complete chaos, partially because everyone's screaming because they just got hit and grabbing onto things and trying to remain standing because the ship is spinning, but also because soon all of the technology and electricity on the ship would fail. Some of it would be restored through backup systems, but within five minutes, the Fitzgerald, one of those powerful ships in the world, was crippled and barely afloat. The story of the Fitzgerald is a very dramatic one. A lot of the research for this episode comes from an article by ProPublica called Death and Valor on a Warship Doomed by Its Own Navy. Fight the ship. Uh, I would really recommend that you read it. It's very, very good, and it sort of brings all of what I'm about to tell you to life and does tons of other details that aren't going to make it into this podcast. It's a really good story, partially because a lot of dramatic things happen. Things like, remember how I said the crystal, when it hit, it punctured the captain's quarters. The captain of the ship was asleep, and he gets trapped in his court quarters. When the um, ship punctures, uh, it forces several just strips of metal get sheared away. And they actually hit him in the head, and they jam the door. The captain would wake up in the dark with no lights. He's actually looking at the Pacific Ocean because, like, the wall of his quarters had been gouged out. Um, and he phones the ship. He, he feels uh, disoriented. He feels confused, blurry, and he realizes that his head is bleeding. So he calls the bridge, and he says that he's trapped. This is before everything kind of shuts down uh, electricity-wise. So, Enlisted Men Clark, Senior Chief Perez, and Chief Petty Officer Agligvi, and Ensign White, these are all pretty important people on this ship, uh, they go to free the captain. Uh, for reference, a Senior Chief and a Chief Petty Officer are people who have been in the Navy for probably well over a decade. These are not officers themselves, they're what they're called, we call non-commissioned officers. They are very experienced sailors who are responsible for training and assigning and working with um, all of the sort of grunts of the ship. And they're technically under the officers, but they're kind of relied on for their experience to and to give um, lots of advice. Uh, their, con their console is often asked for. And they're kind of often seen as the tough, gritty backbone of a ship. And you have these guys banging on the door of the captain's quarters with a sledgehammer trying to get it open. A Gligvi cracks the door dozens of times. He hands it off to Clark, who hands it off to White. Clark goes and he grabs a 35-pound kettleball and hurls it at the door. It barely makes a dent. This is a 3 8 inch metal door that they are just desperately trying to get through because they know that water is is flooding in to the captain's quarters. Eventually, uh, Perez and White, uh, which, by the way, Ensign White, uh, who, again, is a young guy, and Perez is obviously much older because he's a senior chief. He's been in there a while. Uh, White is a huge guy. He was actually a football player. Uh, he's well over six feet, and they just bear hug each other, and they throw themselves at the door like a human cannonball. Uh, and this barely budges the door open. They push the door because, you know, water's holding it uh, closed. They push it open just pitch black. So Perez and a sailor named Codwell and two others, they hold onto each other's belts as they slowly advance into the quarters. There's luch electrical cables sparking off the ceiling. The Pacific Ocean stretches out in front of them. They don't care. They are there for the captain. The captain is disoriented. Remember, he's been hit in the head, and he's struggling to put on his boots. He, he looks strange. Uh, Benson was often known as a strict disciplinarian, as a man you could count on by the crew, but here he looks disoriented and fumbling. He's trying to tie his shoes, but he can't, and Codwell holds out his hand and says, Fuck your boots, Captain! Grab my hand! And the chain of men hauls the captain out. He is taken to the bridge. He, he wants to take control. This is his situation to fix. This is his situation to take command of. He gets into his chair, but then his body goes rigid and he slides out in shock. He starts to spasm. This is a guy who has been soaking in 70 degree Pacific water. And 70 degrees are like, oh, that's fine. No, that that's the air. Uh, if you go, I've been mountain lake swimming in 70 degree water. 
it is not a fun time, especially if you're not used to it. And uh, Senior Chief Agligvi, he thinks that the captain is going into shock, into hypothermia. So he orders Ensign White, who remember is an officer, to strip his shirt off and lay on the captain to prevent hypothermia. And White does it. Meanwhile, in Birthing 2, where the other puncture of the ship happened, you have men getting literally thrown out of their bunks when that initial impact happens, and the ship just lists to starboard. So, like, you're sleeping, you're sleeping, you're on a bunk bed, and just suddenly, boom, you are thrown. You probably hit the metal pole of the bunk next to you, and you just wake up in water, gushing through. It's pitch black in the Birthings most times of the day. Remember that... Uh, this is a ship with day shift and night shift, so no matter what time of day it is, even in the morning, even in, like, noon, bright sun's out, people are asleep because people have to be on the night shift. So, the berthing, the sleeping quarters, is dark most of the time, so people can catch that sleep. You know, it's got foot lockers in there for people's personal belongings, but you've got oh, around 30 guys just all in these bunk beds. And they are awake in this super cold water. They wake up and the leaders amongst them start shoving each other towards the port ladder. They're shoving them towards the port ladder because the starboard exit of Birthing 2 has become blocked by debris. All of the casualties from this event would be from men who have been sleeping on the starboard side. One of the people shoving other sailors towards that ladder is a petty officer first class named Vaughn, whose bunkmate Taipa and him would stand on, near the ladder and just be basically both hauling men towards it. These guys, they had trained for this. They had trained to get out of berthing to blindfolded. And Vaughn and Taipa are making sure that everybody is getting out. Eventually, they have to get up up out of berthing too. The water is at their groins at this point. It's coming up to their ribs. And they wait. They get out of the ladder and they watch as the water fills up. They, they try and wonder how many people went out next to them. They're, they're doing a quick head count. How, there's there's, there's got to be people still in there. And there was. There's a man named Mead. Mead was almost one of the casualties. He tried to grip the ladder, but right before he did, the ship tilted and he gets sucked back into the bathroom the, the water is up to his shoulders at this point and a series of lockers fall onto the bathroom threshold and are blocking the exit mead he fights and he fights but he can't get over and suddenly he feels a shove from behind him he, he gets free of the lockers but birthing two is almost completely flooded he has to go up to a pocket of air on the ceiling remember it is pitch black mead tries to get one more gas of water, but he takes in a little bit of seawater and oily chemicals. He's confused, he's disoriented, it's pitch black. He desperately grabs a pipe and flings himself towards the ladder in the water. He grabs the ladder, he gets up, and Vaughn and Taipa haul him onto the deck. They're heroes. And Vaughn would later realize that while he was getting everybody out, while he was hauling Mead out, his leg was shattered in three pieces. They get Mead out, but this means that water gets more and more into the ship, and it makes it impossible to fully close the hatch. This is becoming a problem. One of the men who got out of Birthing 2 was a guy named Helmsman. Uh, I'm probably going to mess up this name because there's a lot of like CHs and constants in it. Uh, Scrimshire, who runs from Birthing 2 straight to the bridge. He's running to the bridge because he is an experienced helmsman. Um, and he is actually going to end up steering the ship. He can't steer from the bridge because remember the technology is dead. He has to steer from a separate uh, steering console in the navigation compartment where he can see nothing. And he's basically just like getting uh, commands relayed to him from the ex uh, the exo, the executive officer, Babbitt. Babbitt is the second in command of the ship, and he's giving uh, Scrimshire all of his orders for Scrimshire to navigate. Scrimshire will be on helm for 15 hours. Now, obviously, there's a lot of water coming into the ship. Eventually, over 500 tons of water would be uh, 
in the ship. Uh, and the person in charge of making sure they don't all die is Lieutenant Junior Grade Stephanie Bro, who is another one of the heroes of this story. She is actually the assistant over damage control, but she's the one in damage control when this all goes down, or she gets a damage control first. So she announces over the intercom that she is taking control of damage control. And this is actually one of the last uh, messages that goes out over the intercom before uh, they are down to backup comms to communicate. Soldiers are stumbling around in the dark. They're using flashlights and cell phones because the main water is out. Uh, Bro is doing algebra on the back of her notebook by hand to figure out uh, where the water's weight is affecting the ship. Remember, at this point, we're at a seven degree starboard list. And that's after they settle out. Um, the main... Uh, the main pumps of the ship would fail, and they were down to using gas-powered hand bumps. These are the same things that you can buy, like, a shop vac at uh, Home Depot or Lowe's, a general store. And they are using these gas-powered hand pumps just to get the water out of the ship. And this would eventually create this, like, haze uh, in the air, just make it hard to breathe uh, throughout the entire thing. The ship is is just crippled at this point. It's limping along at five knots. It's only got one propeller that's working. And five knots is the fastest that the ship can go because otherwise uh, water would flood into it faster. The captain, remember, is unconscious and might be close to dying at this point. They don't fully know. So the person in charge is Exo Babbitt, like I said. And Babbitt, uh, he, he gets a little bit of a challenge to his command because several of his non-commissioned officers, like Agligvi, Perez, and Vaughn, uh, they really want to strap on scuba gear and get into berfing 2 to rescue the now, they've done a head count, seven people missing. Babbitt says no, and um, Olivi Perez and Vaughn, they just defy him and go behind his back. They draw lots uh, uh, to determine, I think it's Perez who actually gets to get on the gear and go do it. I think it is um, so, yeah. They're unsuccessful, they they can't find anybody. Um, there were also five men uh, trapped in the sonar room that they were able to get out. And, and most of these guys, again, this this happens at 1.30, and by now it's 2. Every, but most people are in t-shirts and underwear. They're, they've been soaked from 7-degree water. Uh, and they are working tirelessly to first do a head count to get to their station and see if they can do anything. But eventually, a lot of them would end up rotating uh, through what Bro judges as sort of the last big thing they need to do to save the ship. Remember, they're able to use these gas-powered pumps to get most of the water out, but there's still tons of water at the bottom of the ship in the torpedo room. And the solution to get all this water out or to stabilize it so the ship doesn't sink is to form a two-dozen-man, ten-gallon bucket line. Guy scoops up water in a 10-gallon bucket, hands it to the next guy. Uh, this line would snake up three flights of the ship. That's three decks. That's going. The bucket is going up ladders. Over two dozen people would be on this line. It's about like 24 or 25. And uh, they've obviously been rotating it in and out. Now, I don't know uh, if you've carried 10-gallon buckets of water. I maybe have done... That's an obscene amount of weight to be doing over and over. Again, they're carrying these up ladders sometimes, and this would go on for 10 hours to bail the water from the lower missile room. Uh, help wouldn't come until 4.37. That's over three hours after the initial impact. Uh, the crystal, to its credit, will actually come back to the place of the crash to try and uh, assist, but they're not able to... Um, to, to find them. Help would come from the Japanese Coast Guard, uh, who would arrive, um, but the only person on the ship who spoke Japanese is currently missing. Uh, the Coast Guard would mostly rescue the wounded captain, who is still unconscious. Um, he would be strapped to a gurney and taken out by helicopter. The helicopter couldn't actually land on the ship because it's at a starboard list. So they ended up having to uh, strap him to a gurney and then make that gurney go vertical and get him up a rope ladder, which does not sound fun. No. Around 8.30, tugboats would arrive from the U.S. Navy 
Um, a uh, few hours after that, Denver Destroyer would show up to help out, get everybody food, kind of taken care of. And um, the uh, Fitzgerald would limp into the Yokosuka Harbor um, in the afternoon. Uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of Japanese civilians would come up to see this legendary, powerful symbol of American strength and pride crumpled on the front, damaged, and just limp into the harbor. It was tied up on Pier 12 at 7 p.m. We're going to tell you in a little bit why it got into that crash, why it didn't realize uh, that those ships were so close to it, and why things were as bad as they were. But that was not the only incident of 2017. No, it wasn't. In August, the 7th Fleet would fall victim to another incident involving a Burke-class destroyer colliding with a commercial vessel. In this case, the ship in question was the USS John S. McCain. Now, the John S. McCain is rather unique in the Navy in terms of who it's named after. Pretty much every other destroyer, um, really any ship that's named after a person, is named after a single person. The John S. McCain, on the other hand, is officially, according to the Navy Register, named after three people. Um which is really something I, at least I've never seen before. Uh, it's named after, in specific, John S. McCain Sr., who was admiral in the U.S. Navy during World War II, uh, John S. McCain Jr., who was an admiral during the Cold War, and just recently has also had John S. McCain III, who's probably the John McCain you're familiar with, this being Senator McCain, was added to the ship's namesake much more recently. So... You, you can't have a ship named after you unless you're dead, right? Yes, yeah. So uh, John McCain III was added to the namesake after he passed away. So this would be after this incident. Now, on the early morning of August the 21st, 2017, uh, the McCain was sailing westwards at around 18 knots towards the Singapore Strait. Now, the Singapore Strait, for those who don't know, it's also called the Strait of Malacca is one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. The reason why is if you look at the map, you'll notice if you're trying to get your ship from the Pacific Ocean into the Indian Ocean, or vice versa, say if you're sailing from China to India, the Singapore Strait's the fastest route. It's, it's not an exaggeration to say the Strait of Malacca is arguably historic, like for most of human history, like the most important shipping lane in the world. Yes, yeah. And you, you can go through the Sunda Strait a little bit to the south, but that adds distance and time, and time is money. So the McCain is sailing westwards, and it's sailing north of a lane that is mostly filled with slower commercial traffic. This means that the McCain is essentially passing ships constantly, um, not in front of them, just alongside them. Now, the captain of the McCain is one Commander Alfredo Sanchez, um, while the um, executive officer, who's also on the bridge, is Jesse Sanchez. No relation. This is probably a, a good opportunity, as like the, the Navy uh, stand here, um, to mention that they just said the captain of the ship was Commander Alfredo Sanchez. What does that mean? Okay, so captain, in sense of a Navy ship, is not so much a rank, but it's a position, okay? If you are in charge of the ship, you are the captain of the ship. But captain is also a military rank. Now, the Navy does its officer ranks uh, different from the other uh, branches of the armed forces because it likes to be special. Yeah. So, for <laughs> instance, in the Air Force or the Army, a captain is an O3. After you become a lieutenant, you become a um, captain. Uh, the Navy does not work like that. In fact, in the Navy, there's uh, sep there's like several lieutenants. There's like lieutenant junior grade, and then a lieutenant in the Navy is actually equivalent to a captain in the Army. They're both O3. A captain in the Navy is an O6, which is equivalent to an Army full bird colonel. There's not a lot of people with that rank. Uh if you wanted to have an O6 uh, in charge of every single um, ship, you, you'd have to massively restructure your chain of command. Yeah. That's not <laughs> necessary. A commander is an O5, and they are more than capable of uh, commanding a ship like this. Uh, so 
Al- Sanchez is a commander, but when we talk about him in his role on the um, ship, he is the captain. Likewise, the Fitzgerald. The Fitzgerald, uh, we'll get into a bit, is commanded by Commander Benson, who, when he's on the Fitzgerald and he's in charge of it, he's Captain Benson. Yeah, you really won't see a full captain um, in charge of a ship all that much, except for on the larger ships, such as aircraft carriers. Most destroyers will be captained by, by a commander. Since this incident occurred after the Fitzgerald collision, as you can imagine, that collision was on everybody's mind, and that includes Captain Sanchez. Now, he obviously did not want to repeat the the errors of the Fitzgerald, and one of the things he was concerned about was crew fatigue. He wanted his crew to be well-rested, and this meant that against the advice of his navigator and executive officer, the bridge on the, the early morning of August 21st was not heavily manned, despite the fact that they were in a very busy shipping lane. Sanchez wanted his, his crew to have some rest. Now, around 4.30 a.m., Captain Sanchez allowed the acting helmsman to leave the bridge in order to grab a meal, and control over steering and propulsion of the ship was assumed by one of the bridge lookouts, uh, a sailor by the name of Dakota Bordeaux. Now, Bordeaux had helmed the ship previously about six times, so he's not totally new to this role, but he was still fairly inexperienced. At this point, it's worth noting that the McCain was being controlled by a touchscreen computer system known as IBNS, the Integrated Bridge and Navigation System, which was installed on the ship just a year prior. The Fitzgerald did not have IBNS. You know, most ships in the Navy at this point in time didn't, but the McCain did. In theory, IBNS would be fantastic for a ship. It would allow for a reduced workload on the crew, and it would um, mean that you, you would have to have less people on the bridge at any given time. In reality, though, the system was plagued by errors and glitches that made it very difficult to work with. And how are they, like, controlling and interacting with IBNS? Like, what is this? So the IBNS takes the form of consoles with large touchscreens. Indeed, most of the controls are done via touchscreen. The touchscreen will have... So, so it's like working an iPad. Yeah, it'll have accession for the rudder, for the throttles, and displaying... Um, you know, lookouts from the radar and whatnot. It's not exactly an iPad, simply due to the fact it's actually much older. While it was only installed in 2016, the design of IBNS goes back to the early 2000s. So you can imagine a, an early 2000s operating system and touchscreen, and you can see why it might be a little bit problematic. <laughs> if, if, if some of you are too young to remember touchscreens before, before the iPad and, I, and iPhone, they were not very good. Due to the fact that IBNS was so um, error-prone, the captain had actually switched it to backup mode prior to entering the Strait of Malacca. Backup mode got rid of some of the um, just some of the computerized functions and made it less prone to crashing. Now, Bordeaux was physically standing at the helm station of the ship control console. This console is roughly at the center of the bridge, and the helm station is on the is on the left. Shortly after Bordeaux um, assumed control over the ship's navigation and propulsion, Captain Sanchez noted that he seemed a little bit flustered with the IBNS controls, and as a result, he had co- he ordered control of the ship to be split between Bordeaux at the helm station and another sailor by the name of Dontrius Mitchell, who was manning the lee helm, which is to the right of to the right of Bordeaux. In specific, Mitchell was to assume control over the ship's throttle, as Bordeaux remained in control of the rudder. Now, this was something that neither sailor had much practice with, though it's not an uncommon procedure in the Navy. This is when things start to go wrong for the McKay. At 5.20 a.m., Bordeaux began to shift control over propulsion over to Mitchell. Now, this process was overseen by the boatswain's mate, Anthony Gillian. Boatswain's mate. So, uh... (laughs) Ba- all right, the way I understand it, is, so you've got like one guy controlling, like for in- to do an analogy to a car, you've got like one guy steering and one guy doing the acceleration and the brakes. 
Yes, precisely. And it, it sounds very strange for, um, you know, people who are used to driving cars, but it's not really that uncommon for ships. Uh, you know, inputs in ships take a longer time. They're not as sudden. And this means that this is actually something that's possible to do, unlike in a car, which would be very difficult. Now, both Gillian and Mitchell had recently transferred over to the McCain from the USS Antietam, a cruiser, um, following an incident in which the Antietam had run aground. Now, the Antietam did not have IVNS, meaning that both men had very minimal training on the system. Now, things began to go wrong shortly after 5.20 a.m., when Bordeaux, unbeknownst to himself, transferred over control of steering instead of propulsion to the Wee Helm. Bordeaux would later testify that he did not intentionally transcend over control of steering, and he did not press the, uh, the button that would do so. However, analysis of the console system reveals that he most likely did, on accident, simply brush up against the wrong control. And that's one of the issues with touchscreens, the lack of tactile feedback. Now, Gillian, who is at this point in time observing the process, began to transfer control over the propeller shafts to the Wee Helm as well. Let's step back a bit and talk about the propellers on the Burke. A Burke-class destroyer has two propellers and two propeller shafts, one on the port, one on the starboard side each one connected to two engines. So is that two engines for each propeller or two engines total? Uh, two engines for each propeller. And these are jet turbine engines, essentially. So Gillian has to transfer over control of the shafts individually. Now he is able to transfer over control over the port shaft to Mitchell. He is interrupted by Bordeaux declaring a loss of steering on the ship. Bordeaux had noticed that the rudder suddenly had turned unresponsive to his inputs, and not knowing what was the cause of this, he stated out loud that he had a loss of steering, which is a very dangerous thing for any ship. This had the side effect of interrupting Gillian's process. Gillian was able to shortly afterwards, though, to send over control over the starboard shaft to the Wee Helm, but perhaps due to the heightened tensions following Bordeaux's notice, he forgot to check the small box that would gang the shafts together, essentially linking their speed together, meaning that they would maintain equal equal thrust. So let, let's roll this back for a second. Just to summarize, we've got one guy doing steering, we've got one guy doing propulsion, right? Yes. And so let's back up and summarize. There's one guy doing steering, there's one guy doing propulsion. The guy doing steering accidentally sends his steering ability over to the guy doing propulsion. Um, and he starts to freak out because he doesn't have control. And this uh, disturbs the guy who is doing propulsion, who also now has control of steering. And it makes him mess up the, the system where he's going to transfer his stuff over to the Lee helm. And he makes it so the two propellers are not working in tandem, correct? Correct. So when Captain Sanchez, upon hearing Bordeaux's declaration of a loss of steering control, orders the ship to be slowed down, Mitchell, in charge of propulsion, does what, what anybody would do and brings the throttle down. But since the two propellers aren't linked, he makes a mistake where he lowers the, the throttle for the left side, for the port side of the ship. But the starboard propeller keeps churning at the same rate. Now, it doesn't really take much um, knowledge of ships to understand that this has the effect of causing the McCain to veer sharply to its left. And that happens to put it in a path where it's crossing right in front of the ship that the McCain was overtaking, the Liberian tanker, the Alnick MC. Now, seeing that the ship was now on a collision course with a tanker, the captain took the emergency measure of ordering the aft steering station to resume control of the ship. Now, one of the things which we haven't really talked about is these destroyers can be controlled from multiple locations, obviously as a form of redundancy. You don't want a situation where if the bridge is disabled, the ship is no longer able to be controlled. And this means, Remember, these things are war machines. Yeah. They are built to withstand damage. And this means that at the aft of, of, of a Burke-class destroyer, there's an additional room with steering consoles. 
that can resume control in emergency situations. Now, hearing this order, the sailors in the aft press what is simply known as the big red button, which is a red physical button on the IBNS consoles to assume control. Now, this might have prevented a collision if it were not for the fact that most of the sailors aboard the bridge of the McCain didn't really seem to know how this button worked. They thought that pressing the button would send control to the aft. In reality, pressing it sends control to whichever station the button is located on. And they, thinking that they had to send control to the aft after the aft had already resumed control, pressed the button on their stations, bringing control back to the bridge. So the aft tries to take control, but then immediately control is snatched away from them. Correct. And this means that there's no one to stop the ship from continuing on its big tor- turn towards port. And before anybody can really figure out exactly what was going wrong, the McCain crosses in front of the Alnick, and the Alnick slams into the port stern side of the John McCain, immediately breaching one of the berthing compartments and flooding it with water. Now, as we talked a little bit, about, you talked a little bit about berthing compartments on your section, so I don't really have to explain what those are. But at this moment, this berthing compartment had 17 sailors sleeping in it, and it's almost immediately flooded with water because the bulbous bow of the Alnick penetrates it directly. Um, seven of the sailors are able to make it out successfully, but 10 of them will simply drown in the, uh, in the subsequent minutes with really no hope of, of rescue. Now, because the bridge because the bridge officers were not in themselves injured, unlike with the Fitzgerald, they are able to assume control over the damage control um, operations very quickly. And the McCain being less physically damaged than the Fitzgerald was, is never really at danger of sinking. They're able to bring the ship back under control relatively um, fast. In fact, by 6.30 a.m., they were already steaming back on the way to, to Singapore. Um, the USS America, as well as the Republic of Singapore Navy and the Malaysian Navy, also dispatched ships to help search for sailors who might have been um, pulled into the water. But ultimately, none of them were found alive. Yeah, uh, obviously, it's never great to crash. But right next to Singapore, there, there are worse places to crash. There's plenty of people yeah. to help out. Yeah, really. Sure, yeah. Relief is, re- is very quick, but... Unfortunately, to the 10 sailors aboard the um, McCain who lost their lives, it was just such a sudden incident that really nothing could they have probably, been... They probably didn't... Did they die on impact, or was it just like a very quick drowning, cause, like water flooded in super fast? Some of them probably died due to injuries sustained on impact. Most of the rest probably drowned. Because, like, their bedroom just, like, crumpled in around them as, like, a giant prow of a ship is shoved through it. Yeah, and, and if you've ever seen a commercial ship, a lot of them have what's called a bulbous bow, which essentially is a, a protrusion on the front of the ship. It, it helps increase its efficiency that almost acts like a battering ram if you have a collision. If you think of like the rams on old um, Greek and Roman Navy ships, it's, it almost acts like that. So that's the Fitzgerald and that's the McCain. But it was not, that's, that's, that's not the full story of, of either ship or the Seventh Fleet. Now, the Seventh Fleet, remember, this is 2017. Uh, I know that the coronavirus has kind of obliterated all sense of time and history, but there were things that happened politically and in the world before uh, March of 2020. And uh, 2017 is obviously the first year of the Trump presidency. And if y'all remember, this is when he engaged in some moderate brinksmanship with the leadership of North Korea. Uh, It's worth knowing that the Kims have a history of getting frisky whenever there's a new American or South Korean president. But, you know, this is where you get the fire and fury talk and um, 
Trump wants to assert himself on the world stage by using the Navy to patrol all around uh, the Korean Peninsula. And this uh, is at the same time when the Chinese Navy is really asserting control over the South China Sea. You know, Jay, you said before that China has been building a lot of warships recently. Oh, yeah. They're putting just multiple destroyers into the water every year. They're building, they're working on two aircraft carriers. They're working on several on the helicopter carriers. So their Navy is expanding at a fast rate. And this also means there will be more confrontations with uh, Japanese warships. And um, this meant that the 7th Fleet starts getting run ragged. Uh, there's not a lot of time spent in port. They are just being given mission after mission to just fly all over this ocean. Uh, the person in charge of the 7th Fleet is Vice Admiral Ocoin. This is the, um, I think that's how his name is pronounced. Ocoin? Ocoin? I, I don't know, nor do I really care. Uh, fuck him. Uh, he's p- partially responsible for 17 men dying. Um, yeah. But it is worth noting that he is consistently ignored for years as he's requesting more funds, more manpower, and more time uh, to fix his ships. So now we're going to go back, we're going to rewind the clock, and we're going to talk about why the um, Fitzgerald and the McCain crashed. And again, it's worth noting that the um, that there were another ship running aground, and the, the, there were several minor incidents um, in 2017, some of which we're about to get into with the Fitzgerald, um, but these yeah. are the two deadly ones that we're focusing on. So, the Fitzgerald... I started our story at uh, 1.20 a.m. on the 17th when the crash happened at 1.30, but you really got to go back uh, and understand that the Fitzgerald was kind of barely functioning as a warship. Um, Its entire crew was overworked, and it was understaffed by more than 30 people. I think there was supposed to be, like, 203 people on it and they had like 170 benson their captain had taken over just a little over a month before and he had to cancel leave that the previous cabin had promised the reason they're having to cancel people's leave is they, they can't offer people leave because they're already 30 people undermanned and that's after they had gotten a new influx of sailors oh, uh, 40% of the crew of the Fitzgerald were green. They've only been on the ship for eight months or less, okay? Which means al- that almost half of the people on this already undermanned ship are not fully trained. They had no senior quartermaster, and they had no radar technician. That's the crew. Then you start to move into the senior officers. Now, uh, Commander Benson... If you read especially the ProPublica article, and it's worth noting that um, I got to summarize a very sexy, professionally written uh, journalistic article uh, for most of my research. I read a little bit more than that, obviously, but uh, Jay was mostly going off of just Navy reports and a lot more dry. Yeah, I was mostly the report from the U.S. Navy as well as the, the NTSB, so... Relatively dry. Yeah, the, the McCain crash is less dramatic and has less sort of crazy incidents, though I would say it, it is a more hectic tale um, in many ways. Yeah, it really is. From when things begin to go wrong to when uh, the actual collision is a time span of about three minutes. So it's a lot going wrong in a very short period of time, and people really just don't have time to react. Yeah, so. Like I said, uh, if you read the article, Commander Benson is, at first, a very, like, uh, sympathetic figure. I felt for him for a long time. I mean, the guy, like, the guy came close to dying. I mean, he's hit in the head and goes into shock. He spends pretty much the entire night of the crash disabled. But Benson is responsible uh, in for a lot of what happened. Uh, This is an ambitious guy. He's in his very early 40s, and he is marked for promotion by the Navy. You do not get put in charge of an Arling Burke destroyer unless people think you're going to go somewhere. A lot of people thought this guy was going to be an admiral. He has something to prove, and the Navy likes him because he has something to prove. He's ambitious, and he's going to run his crew hot. Um, 
There was an incident just like a few weeks before this where the Fitzgerald actually had almost crashed into another ship in formation because of some really ambitious orders that Benson had given. Uh, despite this, the crew liked him. He was generally seen as an improvement over the last guy. Um, he was strict, but he was fair. But again, he's only been in this position for a month. That month, though, uh, that was long enough for Benson to know how utterly fucked his ship was. We're going to get into that in a sec, but um, Benson was fully cognizant of the deficiencies, and he could have refused his orders. It would be almost unheard of for anyone in his position to do so, and in fact, the people that the, that the Navy selects for positions like this are people ambitious enough and cocky enough to really never do that, but... Benson knew how obscene it was that um, he would be asked to do this, to take his ship all over the South China Sea in Japan, despite having a overworked and undertrained crew. And he did it anyway. Um, Benson was asleep the night of the crash. Uh, on the 17th, he reported he, he, he judged... He was suffering from sleep deprivation and exhaustion, so it was good that he caught some Z's. Um, he could have slept near to the bridge. There's actually like a small bed uh, for the captain to do just that, but he went to his quarters. He's like, I've been running myself ragged. I need to recuperate. Uh, we'll return to this, but part of the tragedy of the Fitzgerald is that uh, Benson knew how bad things were going for him. Uh, the reason that they were going 20 knots that night is because Benson wasn't just being ambitious. He was trying to get to his location ahead of time. He was trying to get there ahead of time so he could set away some time to do training. Um, but he wasn't the only senior officer that ran into some problems. Um, there were several clashes with uh, Babbitt, the second in command, and Furquan, the, the combat officer, um, who had had some personality conflicts with the captain over the sea of the ship. Um, at the time of the crash, uh, Lieutenant Natalie Combs, the operations officer, she was in the combat information center. Now, this is where all of the ship's weapons can be launched. It's also where the main radar systems is. Uh, remember, this is 1.30 at night. She's been awake since before sunrise, okay? This is how hot these people are running, okay? Th think about when you've been up for 20 hours. And now, th think about, like, how competent you are. Now, think about if you are in charge of a warship that could obliterate a city in a matter of seconds. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, in the official Navy report would heavily criticize Combs for not communicating enough with the bridge. Essentially, she's supposed to be constantly talking to the bridge about how many ships she's seeing on the uh, radar. And many people would note that Combs should have realized that she was seeing suspiciously few ships uh, be that the radar technicians were reporting to her. So let's talk about the radar failures. The number one reason that this ship crashed was probably down to not enough people and not enough training. But the second reason I'm just going to say is the radar failures. Remember, they didn't have the person assigned to the ship that was supposed to be able to tune and fix this thing. Uh, radars are great, but you have to use them properly. Um, they at the time of the crash, were not tuned to the right range. Uh, essentially, the radar was set to detect ships really far away uh, and not ships close to it. Obviously, when it comes to colliding with things, you need to know about things that are really up close to you. The button that they would use to tune it uh, was actually broken and was taped over, and most of the crew was not fully trained on how to use it. Uh... Radar men have an automatic system that they use to, quote, hook onto targets and then track them on the radar. And that system uh, was practically non-functional. In order to use it, you had to refresh it constantly. This meant tapping a button uh, several hundred times a minute. Uh, and so you looked like, you, it was said you looked like you were operating Morse code, just tapping this button over and over to refresh this computer system. 
At the time of the crash, the radar man only saw ships headed in the opposite direction when there were ships just a few thousand feet from his craft. This ties into the mechanical failures with the ship in general, okay? Uh, the ship's whole email system for both classified and non-classified system was down. So in order to communicate with each other, the officers and the listen they were all using Gmail. Think about that for a second. <laughs> They're using Gmail. Yeah. Um, they Two weeks before the crash, they had an electrical fire which shut down the whole electrical system. Um, the crash took place at the place on the pitch at night in a busy shipping lane going 20 knots, which was faster than you would normally do this. Uh, when the crash happened, the conning officer, it's his first time on the con. And remember, the helmsman had a total of 25 minutes of experience. Um, the conning officer who's watching the radar on the bridge, uh, time of crash, uh, he had a very blurry and untuned radar view of just a few ships, when in fact there are two dozen ships around them at the time. I might not be remembering this correctly, but the two officers in charge of the bridge at the time, they had only sailed this route once before, and that was in the middle of the day when you can see things. Now, remember where I said everybody was green and not really trained well? Well, one of those people was Ensign Womack, who has been in the Navy... Again, he joined very recently, he's an ensign, he's been sailing for only a few months, and he hasn't been fully cleared to stand watch yet. Uh, now, it, it might sound easy to stand watch, like you, you just walk around and look out at the water, but there is a skill to it, you know, judging how far away ships are and maintaining alertness for hours on hours. You, you gotta get used to it. So, Parker, the second-in-command on the bridge... She's like, all right, let's get some training in. And she grabs um, Womack, and they both go onto the port side of the ship to uh, train Womack on how to stand watch. Throughout, like, the last few months of the Fitzgerald going around, they did not have enough people to consistently have both starboard and port lookouts. Remember, they got hit from starboard, and uh, Parker, she was training Womack on the port side. When they came back to starboard, they realized they had a problem. By 125, they realize that things are going really bad, and they're, they can see two ships that they are like about to be in between. And Kopik, the lieutenant in charge... She has a note from Benson to wake her if anything's gone wrong goes wrong. She does not. Remember, this is a highly ambitious person who wants to be in a senior position in the Navy. She succeeded before. Benson actually trusts her and has identified her as one of the people that he uh, relies on the most. Um, and she's like, no, I'm going to let him sleep. Uh, a lot of people, including the Navy official report, will say that she should have asked the captain for help. I personally, considering, like, when the crash happens, question whether or not Benson would have been able to get there and, like, do anything in time, but yeah. um, it certainly uh, what, what was a breach in judgment. Around 1.30, Kopik sees the crystal, and she calls for an invasive turn. Remember, this is 30 seconds before the crash. Uh, Womack, uh, the conning officer, remember, who is very green, he hesitates, he doesn't relay the order quickly enough to the helmsman. Um, so... Kopik realizes that she just called for hard turn to starboard, but if she turns to starboard, that's going to hit the Juan Hay. So she freaks out. She yells, oh shit, I'm fucked. I'm so fucked. Um, but then she orders hard to port uh, in just a panic. She's like, oh, if we go, if we go to starboard, we'll hit. So we got to go to port. The correct answer is to stop the ship and just let both of the ships next to her pass her. But in the heat of the moment and just freaking out, this does not occur to her. And probably wouldn't occur, occur to her. It probably wouldn't occur to you. It probably wouldn't occur to me. But she orders a hard deport. And the helmsman in training freezes, okay? So then the other guy takes control. He swings. And, that, and they hit the crystal. Just to recap, you have undermanned people who are all running on, like, minimum they've been up for 20 hours. Um, who are undertrained using bad technology and a radar that doesn't tell them what danger they're in. 
uh, who are inexperienced uh, get put into a terrible situation and they make some bad calls and they freak out and then people who aren't trained well enough to respond fast enough don't respond fast enough to the bad orders and bang. Seven people die. Now, it's worth noting that the crystal was also negligent in this. Uh, the crystal basically did nothing to warn um, the Fitzgerald. They didn't signal on the radio. They didn't honk the horn. Uh, they, they had it on autopilot, and autopilot basically just steered right into it. And they would end up paying $27 million in damages uh, to the U.S. Navy. Now, this would cause a complete firestorm throughout the entire military, not just the 7th um, Fleet yeah. <laughs> of uh, the U.S. Navy. And now everyone, especially in the 7th Fleet, um, is aware that the fact that they are undermanned and undertrained uh, is literally getting people killed. And that would, uh, Jay, like you said, heavily affect the decisions that the people in charge of the McCain made. Yeah, and, and really, it's a it's an interesting illustration of the fact that human beings can observe the mistakes of other people and come away with lessons that aren't necessarily correct. The you know I don't want to judge um, Captain Sanchez too much of the McCain. Uh, you know I, I obviously don't know him. Um, there's really there's not enough material for me to make firm judgments of his personality, but he comes across as somebody who did genuinely want the best for his crew, and his idea of accomplishing that was not overworking his crew. He didn't want them to be fatigued. Because that is what killed the crew of the Fitzgerald. Yes, but he probably swung a little bit too far in the opposite direction. Um he had not set the ship, the McCain, at what's called sea and anchor detail, which is just a heightened detail where you have more people man manning critical positions aboard the ship, despite the fact that the waters around Singapore are very crowded, and in spite of the recommendations from his ship's navigator and commanding officer, and, and executive officer. And what's probably going through his head is, I'm good enough to get away with it. Yeah. Um... Remember, everybody in charge of these ships are type A personality people who are fully willing to yell, fully willing to ra raise their voices, uh, fully willing to get boisterous, fully willing to put in the hard hours. Uh, these are people who just have a burning fire in their soul, a need to prove themselves. And the Navy selects for this personality type. Yeah. And the Navy report on the main McCain crash would focus heavily on the command mistakes as well as crew mistakes, and it gives the impression of a somewhat more lax environment aboard the ship. Um, several of the watchstanders who were on the bridge had also not attended the navigation briefing the day prior, and that seems to have been accepted on the ship. It was not seen as abnormal. And the Navy also accused the captain and, command and executive officer of failing to ensure that sufficiently experienced sailors were on duty for every watch assignment. Yeah, one big thing the senior officers do is they is they make the schedule, same way that I, as a manager of a business, will put people on shift. And a big a thing that especially Benson did is you'll put your weak uh, sailors right next to your strong sailors so the strong ones can reinforce and make up for the weak ones. Uh, and that's a big part of the job of a commanding officer. That being said, at least in, when we're talking about the McCain, well, well, I would say that the ultimate cause of the crash was multiple human errors. I wouldn't let the Navy completely off the hook. The Navy's own inquiry found that training schools, quote, did not address the depth of knowledge and skills needed to properly maintain complex electronic navigation systems on ships, specifically the IBNS. Yeah, I, I would not want to use this thing. Uh, I actually use a touchscreen pad uh, at church to mix music for our band, and I often find that annoying, trying to physically drag the sliders. And this is for a uh, Methodist church live stream that, like, 15 people listen to. Like, the, the least important, least high-stakes scenario you can possibly imagine. Uh, not steering a ship in a crowded lane with, you know, missiles aboard. Yeah. 
And while the IBNS in theory had multiple safeguards that probably would have prevented the collision, the fact that it was so buggy and so, propon- and so prone to crashing meant that the captain had ordered meant that the captain was using the system in backup mode, simply meaning that most of those safeguards were not turned on. And and think about that for a second. Like, my computer crashes sometimes, so I have my books and and all of my uh, my YouTube scripts backed up to Google Drive. Like, this is the, the steering system for a Navy destroyer, and it crashes. Like, how is that even allowable? (laughs) Yeah, and, you know, the crew aboard the McCain had developed a standard procedure of simply turning the IBNS off and on again whenever they experienced these issues, because they they had no other way of fixing it. Big oof. Now, I mean, that had to be because the people in charge of the McCain just never requested for repairs or, or, or didn't tell their leaders this is a problem, right? I mean, there have been reports about the issues with IBNS coming from other ships since the, um, since the system began being installed on, on Navy destroyers, but the Navy just overlooked them. So I've heard that in the 21st century, ever since the War on Terror, a lot of congressional budget spending has sort of gone from the Navy uh, toward, say, the Army uh, projecting, say, into Iraq and Afghanistan, and, you know, maybe the Navy's getting crumbs. Do you think that that affected some of this and like not be able to get enough repairs or have money for new ships? That is partially to blame, you know. As much as the U.S. spends on defense, it's not an infinite pool of money. All the branches have to compete for a share of the pie, and while the Navy generally had the largest during the Cold War, um, the two, in the 2000s, the Army really rose to dominate defense spending. As you mentioned, this was due mostly to the war on terror, with Iraq and Afghanistan being land wars in which the Navy really didn't play any role in, apart from the opening stages of Iraq. Now, that being said, I would say that the Navy also has been very ambitious and a bit problematic in choosing how to spend its money. Back during the Trump administration, the Department of Defense came up with the idea that the U.S. had to return to a 355-ship Navy, whereas it had about 290 combat-ready ships. Now, the U.S. had around 355 at the end of the Cold War. It had even more during the height of the Cold War. But this idea that we simply need more and more ships meant that things like maintenance and training and making sure there were enough crews to man all these ships were overlooked. Yeah, and and I want to address a point that I can kind of hear creeping up in the sort of devil's advocate in my head. You know, these destroyers are from the 90s. I'm sure a lot of people think, oh, well, weren't they just like old and and run down? And and why are you using designs from the 90s? Uh, These designs are mint. And to last decades, that's not necessarily a problem. Uh, their their whole navigation systems can be ripped out and re- you install something else and overhauled. Uh, oh, oh, the way these things are built, the way I understand it, almost everything can can come out and be something else can be slotted in. Um, oh yeah, for sure. They just weren't doing the proper maintenance that would be required to make one of these things last for decades. Yeah, you know, it's a fundamentally sound and successful design. I mean. You can only just look at the Chinese Navy and see that their destroyers look almost exactly like Arleigh Burke's. You know, the design works more or less, and we plan on be, on building them well into the 2030s. So obviously, somebody had to burn for this. This is a humiliating uh, turn for the Navy. So... Uh, Vice Admiral Acoin, he, he conducted a lot of investigations, but he gets fired. Uh, he actually gets canned a few weeks before his retirement, which um, sounds like it was done to deliberately like humiliate or spite him, though I don't know enough about Navy culture to fully uh, confirm that. And that, that is most likely the case. You know, if they simply let him retire, that would mean that, you know, they wouldn't be able to punish him, at least in a visual manner. Firing him is a visual you know, sign that they 
they judged him to have done something wrong. And and this is in an organization where people sort of quietly retiring is is often a thing done when like yeah you fuck up ah oh, you uh, you've been yeah. here a while you just like retire and we'll just sweep it under yeah. right. you know they they wanted to make a statement about this guy. Yeah. And, and by the way, yeah. I agree. Like as you know, oh, there's a lot of readings that like oh Aquin like he did try he did try he didn't go public. No. You know, he he never like went to the New York Times and said this is going to get people killed when he probably knew that. Yeah. Um. This is an organization that is that that selects for pride that selects for. That, remember, the Navy is a cult. I say that as a compliment. Like it being a cult is part of the reason it works really really well. But there are consequences to that. That everybody in it loves it. That everybody in it has dedicated to their. If you're an admiral, you're you've spent forty years in this shit. You, this this is what like like you know you you've got memorabilia of the navy all over your house. Th- this is your identity. This is your conception of who you are. You're not gonna break when it needs you. Yeah. If if you don't have enough to complete the mission, you say you're gonna do it anyway. That was our coin. He thought he could do it, mm-hmm. and he couldn't. No. And you know, Rear Admiral Williams as well, who is overseeing the task force, as well as Captain Jeffrey Bennett of the destroyer group. Um, for the Fitzgerald were also both dismissed from their positions. Yeah, so that's basically the entire chain of command over the Fitzgerald and the McCain yes. just ripped yeah. out. They're like, all, all you guys are gone. Um, I'm di- Now, I actually didn't check to see if that happened after the McCain also crashed, but I would imagine it's like the Fitzgerald happens and then everyone puts out a like, hey guys, be careful, and then the McCain happens like, alright, we gotta just rip out root and branch oh yeah the, you know a lot of the higher ups of the seventh fleet are basically dismissed as a result of both of these incidents and jay you had told me earlier the seventh fleet had, had actually at this point like th- they're not just like running like their ships ragged and whatever. There's, there's like been some corruption right could you very briefly explain to us what was going on there oh, yeah throughout the 2010s there was a ongoing scheme involving the 7th Fleet that's known rather colorfully as the Fat Leonard Scandal um, <laughs> after it became publicly knowledge. <laughs> yeah. The, this named actually after a guy named Leonard Glenn Francis, who was a Malaysian businessman. And it turns out that he had essentially been bribing several officers in the 7th Fleet, all the way up to, to you know, Rear Admiral. Shit. Um, with gifts and with prostitutes even. In exchange for them using his service, his port services, he owns a lot of ports in the region. He owns a lot of like logistics companies. And in exchange for the U.S. Navy doing business with him, they were getting you know rewards on the side. And the, the Leonard, the Fat Leonard scandal, isn't directly a cause of these crashes or anything, but it kind of shows how really disconnected the Seventh Fleet had become from. Or the ideas of how how the U.S. military should be run. So for the Fitzgerald especially, there were a lot of criminal charges. Um, r- remember, uh, it, or if you're not aware, in the military, y- they have their own justice system uh, for bringing people to trial and for trying and sentencing them. Uh, so Kopik, uh, the woman who's on the bridge, uh, also a little note that I, I didn't say about her, um, when the captain got to the bridge after the crash, she verbally was in tears, and she said, Captain, I fucked up. Uh, she was uh, so inconsolable, um, afterwards that, uh, Babbitt, the XO who would be in charge of the ship for the rest of, uh, the day, he, he just told her to sit down. Um, I, you know, Kopik was put into a pretty awful position, and, um... I do have some sympathies for her, as I probably would also be a crying mess if that had happened to me. But in, in the end, uh, is, but again, everything around her also failed, but she was the one who fucked up. And she knew it. She yeah. uh, pled guilty to, to dereliction of duty. She was formally reprimanded, and she got uh, three months of half pay, which, causing the death of seven men... Not a lot, and she was actually, um, the reason for that is she was actually set to testify against her superior officers, uh, Benson especially was, um, 
taken up on charges of dereliction of duty and negligent homicide. Um, th- th- this was a long, complicated uh, legal battle that lasted years. Uh, they were eventually dropped, and he was allowed to retire as a commander in 2019. Um, the the big important thing about that is that that allowed him to keep his medical benefits. Um, if you think that Benson deserves to be punished, uh, he, he has been punished. The guy's had long-term brain injuries from uh, the head trauma he sustained in the crash. Um, he possibly also has some mild PTSD over it. Um, there was a lot of PTSD uh, co- um, that popped yeah. up in the crew of what went on. Remember, you have guys who almost drowned. You have people who had their best buddies that they slept next to die. People getting yelled at. Like, just just imagine being the person who's manning the ship for the first time in their life, and they hear the screaming. Like, Jay, have you ever been in a car crash? Thankfully, no. Okay, I I took out a mailbox with one of my, my, my side view mirrors once. And that made, like, a bang and a crash I will never forget. Imagine the screaming funk of, like, shredding metal. And just, like... And just imagine that sound. I I can remember taking up that mailbox from, like, five or six years ago. I can only imagine how long the crew of the Fitzgerald are going to live with that sound. Yeah. You know, and on the aboard the McCain, um, Chief Petty Officer Jeffrey Butler, who is in charge of training sailors on operation of the IBNS, uh, would plead guilty to dereliction of duty as well. He was given a letter of reprimand, which doesn't sound that bad, but that basically means that any chance of future promotion is shut off. You know, people who have these letter of reprimands, you don't get promoted in the Navy. Um, he was docked pay, and he was even demoted one rank, which severely reduces his pension. Yeah, um, it, being chief petty officer, being a petty officer is, is a big difference. Uh, on the note of a um, letter of reprimand, that also happened to the executive officer, Babbitt, of the uh, yeah. Fitzgerald. Uh, to my knowledge, he might still be in the Navy, but he essentially just cannot get promoted from here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Captain Alfredo Sanchez and the executive officer Jesse Sanchez were also both relieved of their commands. And Alfredo Sanchez was initially charged with homicide. That was later dropped, but he also pled guilty to dereliction of duty and was given a letter of reprimand. Um, Perhaps, though, the best illustration of the effects these incidents could have on a crew, at least for the McCain, comes from Bordeaux. He was docked pay and put on probation. But the the PTSD and the you know the anxiety resulting from this incident meant that he basically was no longer effective as a sailor. He wasn't able to fall asleep. He fell to being at least a minor form of alcohol alcoholism, and he was eventually kicked out of the navy. We we like to make this a comedy podcast. We've been sort of uh, trying to keep things light and trying to tell you some crazy stories of what's gone on. Uh, one that I'm going to add on now, because I've just forgotten it, is um, I already said that there's several cases on the Fitzgerald of uh, NCOs giving officers orders. But one other crazy just ranks are fucked situation that happened is after the captain was taken out, there was a um, uh, a seaman who um, was walking around without shoes. This guy was a, basically a cafeteria worker. And... Um, he was uh, told by the captain, who was kind of babbling at this point, uh, and kind of just sitting to the side uh, to get some boots on. And he noticed the captain's boots are next to him, and he asks uh, the XO if he can uh, take the captain's boots, and the, and the XO told him yes. Uh, so, a cafeteria worker wearing the captain's boots is uh, pretty much as, as nutty as you can get in terms of just knowing that this was truly like a crazy catastrophe. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, we need to recognize that this wasn't just a failure from the Navy. This is something that got 17 men killed. And we're going to read off those names right now. Yes. The sailors aboard the McCain who lost their lives on that tragic day were Corey George Ingram, Abraham Lopez, 
Logan Stephen Palmer, John Henry Hoagland III, uh, Dustin Luis Dion, Jacob Daniel Drake, Timothy Thomas Eccles, Charles Nathan Findley, Kenneth Aaron Smith, and Kevin Sire Bushel. Upon the Fitzgerald were Dakota Rigsby, Shingo Douglas, Carlos Sibian, Xavier Martin, Tan Shrong Hyun, apologies if I mispronounce that, No Hernandez, and Gary Rim. Rim or Reem, I actually don't know how it's pronounced. Uh, I really want to highlight him. He was the oldest uh, sailor in um, Birthing 2. During um, my tale of the Fitzgerald uh, crashing, I spent some time talking about the sailors who drowned and almost drowned in Birthing 2 because I really wanted you to like understand the terror of dark of night, water flooding up. And I told the story of Mead, the last man to be hauled out. And I told the story of Mead being shoved from the bathroom. Um, Gary was found in that bathroom. And it is generally agreed upon, or at least speculated, that his last action that he took alive was to shove Mead towards the ladder as his lungs filled with seawater. I want to sum up this episode, because you've heard a lot about systems that didn't work, uh, radar, email, the control steering on the McCain. But I want to talk about the nature of risk, okay? What's risky and what's not? Uh, human beings are terrible at judging this. We talked a lot about that in our Nuclear Warheads episode. But you're at risk every day. Every day you could get struck by lightning. Several times a week I drive in a car, which is one of the most common ways a person my age could die. One thing that human beings have a really terrible time at judging is the difference between a one in a million risk and a one in a hundred risk. Obviously, I shouldn't worry about getting hit by lightning because the chances are just utterly astronomical. If it happens, it happens, but there's no sense in sweating it. But I should be really careful when I drive because if I veer off into oncoming traffic, that's a lot more risky. These Navy ships are incredibly complicated. They have people who are trained for years to operate them. When they're damaged, they're built to withstand that damage. Uh, the water can be bailed out. The hatches can be sealed off. There are several redundant radars, several different people looking out. Uh, even if one of them fails, surely another person can take their place. But as we saw on the Fitzgerald and the McCain understaffed, undermanned, badly trained, or being lax, those systems of safeguards can fall away one by one, and suddenly a one in a million chance becomes a one in a thousand chance, becomes a one in a hundred chance. Then the radar doesn't work. And then the people on watch on the Fitzgerald walk from the starboard side to the port side. And then it all goes wrong. I didn't tell you that the Fitzgerald had had a few other close calls in the months and weeks before. I, I highlighted some of them, but there were a lot of them. And maybe nine times out of ten on July 7th of 2017, the Fitzgerald doesn't hit. Maybe 99 times out of 100 didn't hit. But everything lined up. And that wasn't because of a freak accident. It was because so many things had gone wrong. And the strangest thing is that more things didn't go wrong, okay? I told you stories of heroes tonight. I told you a story about a woman using a flashlight and doing hand math to bail water from the ship. I told you stories of people slamming a door with a sledgehammer to get their captain out of harm's way, of a guy getting people up a ladder with his foot and, and leg broken. One of the weirdest things about incompetence is that competence follows it. The two are intertwined, double helix, and the DNA of destruction. Heroism and dereliction of duty in all of these events where failure happens, you will see the two of them side by side. Because what happens is, the reason that there weren't more crashes is because people who 
did their jobs and knew how to do their jobs prevented them. For every person who's dead, 10 times, maybe 100 times more would be dead if it weren't for the people doing their jobs. That the Navy relied on to do their jobs. But it was people who failed. And the Navy fired those people. They reprimanded them. They docked their pay. They charged them as criminals. Because they failed. They failed the Navy. They failed the system. The Navy and the military in general breaks people's brains. It, bre it teaches their sailors to sacrifice their own physical comfort and even their safety for the larger systems. This is what happens from the moment you step off the bus at boot camp. You can easily make the argument that if the captain of the Fitzgerald had just gotten a little less sleep, if he had, you know, been a little more alert, that maybe they wouldn't have crashed. You could argue that if Bordeaux on the McCain, if he had just kept a cooler head, maybe everything, they, they wouldn't have turned the way they had, and nothing would have happened. People would still be alive. But that's what the culture of the Navy teaches you to do. It's easy to blame people instead of systems. We are people. We can see them. We have, they have faces. We can always say, oh, I would have done better. She should have known better. But it's the system that set people up to fail. It's the system that filled ships with green sailors and broken technology. It's systems that strained folks too hard. And nine times out of ten, 99 times out of 100, 999 times out of 1,000, everything would have been fine. Because the people, they held it up. But the one time comes eventually, and when it did it cost lies and it will be swept under the rug it already has been swept under the rug blamed on people just like the soldiers who died just like the sailors who lost their jobs but the system will survive shifting blame promoting the believers shuffling in someone else to take the fall for the next disaster they're going to be protected from civilian eyes by layers of bureaucracy churning away until they get someone else killed because no one is competent. All right, well, thank you for listening to episode four of No One is Competent. Um, you can find this episode and any of the rest on Spotify, YouTube, and Google Podcasts. And you can follow us up, and you can follow us on Twitter at not underscore competent. Um, if for some reason you feel the need to reach out to us, we do have an email address. No one is competent at gmail.com. And yeah, that's about it. I'd like to um, thank Sam Bryce for providing the music for this episode and going forward. It's really quite excellent. And Jay's you know, lying. He's lying. He, has, he hasn't heard the track yet. <laughs> he hasn't heard the track yet, Sam. He. I'm sure it's good. I'm sure it's good. <laughs> Sam's a really cool guy. You know, and, and if and if you if you'd like to support us, please do. You know, leave a like, ratings, comments, any form of engagement is is great. Tell tell everyone you know about the podcast, your friends, your family, people you like, people you dislike, and. Really anything is, is welcome. We we work really, really hard on this and we would like people to like it if it's good. Is this gonna be good? I've been really trying to make my mic technique better. My brain is melted. Jay, how long have we been recording? We are running up on uh, two hours, 25 minutes. Well, I guess it's really lucky that our next episode is going to be a really simple and easy one. Well, luckily our next episode will be about uh, a much more simple topic. You know, nothing, nothing overly complicated. Just the, just the nine year war in Afghanistan conducted by the Soviet Union. Fun times. All right, folks. Thanks for listening. Y'all be good.